spin the globe and see where you land. What will help you to relate? What will help you to create? What will help you to become a part of something that truly makes a difference? Today, individuals and communities are invariably multicultured. And the ability to communicate or to find success rests on one's ability to navigate with cultural fluency uh, and speak in profound ways that address both the hyper-personal and hyper-local sites of tension, as well as within global, much larger demographics. So this talk will speak to both what is deeply personal and hyper-local, and how it relates to these larger global impacts. I cannot go much further in talking about the future of creativity without defining it. According to Maslow, creativity is a space of essential humanness. When all of the basic human needs have been met, the higher needs for belonging, love, and self-esteem, creativity come into play. Creativity is a basic human need, but deeply buried by a culture that causes us to lose individuality, or that causes us to so fiercely prize our individuality that we lose the merging with the collective imagination that creativity drives. I spent 2010 to 2013 living in Samoa in the South Pacific, and serving in the Peace Corps means uh, total community immersion, working side by side with local leaders to tackle the most pressing challenges of our generation. As a theater maker, I learned best through performance. So I came to learn Samoan culture through student and community performances that I saw, directed, or judged. So pictured here, the youth of Le Rumuenga Samoa, one of my students dressed up as the Taupo of the village, um, a role that's bestowed by the high chief, uh, a Matai, who charges the Taupo with formal reception and entertaining of visitors and guests. Students also experimenting with the modernization and retelling of the Samoan myth of Sina and the eel. And then my year seven students singing from Disney's The Little Mermaid, Under the Sea. <laughs> so through these performances, I came to understand, as much as an outsider really can, the cultural underpinnings of Samoan culture, the Fa Samoa. Both culture and theater are what you do. And as an outsider, understanding those is in, in that reflection, in the theater, and being in a space where you can see, where you can witness what's happening. There are opportunities to define values in public spaces. Theater must be linked to and become a part of the fabric of our cult community. Theater should be reflective of and representative of, of the voices around us, even in the complicated and contentious fissures. Especially in the complicated and contentious fissures, we should seek to create meaning through theater. So I'm speaking to you from Potsdam, New York, and I'm not from here, but how many of you in the audience, by show of hands, are from Potsdam? Okay, not so many. We're just passing through, yeah? Nah. There is no such thing as a transitory space, and everything is a transitory space. Let me, let me say that again. There's no such thing as a transitory space, and everything is a transitory space. Is this not our community? What does it mean to live in a community that you do not claim? What will help you relate? What will help you to create? What will help you to become a part of something that will truly make a difference? Where you're from is most often the first question that people ask when meeting for the first time, that first olive branch of trying to understand who you are and, and where you come from, what that means. But my friends, if, if we're here, then we're responsible to seeing this place. The histories and the stories and the people that you carry with you, no matter where you go, they're not threatened by understanding the hyperlocal. 
In fact, they help us to navigate with cross-cultural nuance and ability to change the world. So let me ground us in one way of seeing here. <clears throat> the North Country region spans from south of the New York State Canadian border to the Erie Canal in the south, and from the edge of Lake on, uh, Champlain in the east to the shores of Lake Ontario in the west. This largely rural and impoverished area where nearly 28% of the residents of St. Lawrence County live below the poverty line has experienced a population drop, as industry has called folks elsewhere. While the upstate New York population has been shrinking, prisons have moved in. Prisons are one industry that shows continual growth and reliable economic support in the rural United States. There are two prison hubs within this region, Clinton and Watertown, which account for 11 prisons. So I've created theater in prisons and jails since 2013, and I know from these years of experience that people behind prison walls are not as the public imagines them to be. And I say this primarily about those who are incarcerated, but I also mean all of those whose lives are touched by the system. Nurses and educators, priests, volunteers, administrators, and of course, correctional officers. So first, expand this local picture to include the crisis of mass incarceration in the United States. There are 6.7 million people who are locked up in our nation's correctional facilities. And this graph here represents just those who are currently housed in correctional facilities, not those 3.7 million who are on probation. Okay? The United States has more prisoners than any other developed nation in the world. In fact, it has more prisoners than all of the other developed nations in the world combined. In 2010, the United States had 4.5% of the world's population about 309 million people, but we incarcerated 23% of the world's prisoners. Those 6.7 million people who are locked up behind bars are mostly men, disproportionately black and brown. And these are widely uh, reported statistics, and they can be difficult to, to navigate and to relate to. But what's critical to remember is that each of these numbers represent people, lives, families, communities. And these are people that we're locking up. Yes, they're people who have been convicted of or who plead out to criminal charges, but they're people nonetheless. In the foreword of Razor Wire Women, prisoners, activists, scholars, and artists, Kathy Boudin writes about the dependence of our society on the economic machine of the prison state, stating that the intersection of inside and outside goes beyond that of individuals in prison and those committed to them. Our society is now shaped by the economic dependence of entire industries and the communities on the economics in prison. Jobs, profits, federal and state budget priorities, there is a dialectic of dependence of our society on prison. This dependence on the prison industrial complex, a system that feeds mostly rural economies with good paying jobs, with benefits, service and health contracts and utility for land that was once used for agrarian purposes creates a complicated dynamic within our community. But because this, these are people that we've locked behind bars, I don't want to linger too long here, but to see faces of men and women uh, in some of California's prisons, beautifully photographed by Peter Mertz. In the past 10 years, all sides of this complicated dynamic have emerged in the shifting societal perception around the role of the, pr of the prison in the US justice system. Some of the highlights, uh, President Obama was the first sitting president to visit a prison and to meet with those incarcerated therein. Obama stopped the privatization of federal prison. The privatization of uh, prisons turns incarceration into an economic boon as prisons are run for profit. But then when Trump came into office, Attorney General Jeff Sessions uh, turned that uh, act around. It was one of his first acts in office. And there have been a number of high sentence pardons just in the last few months with Erlon Woods and Santoya Brown um, that seem to chafe at the tried belief that people are in prison because they deserve to be there. And there's a shift in political sentiment 
the large rallies, the crying out of the inhumanities at ICE facilities, for example, that have seemed to put pressure onto political will. In December 2018, Congress passed the First Step Act, which, as the name implies, is the first step toward substantial criminal justice reform. The act eases mandatory sentencing laws, reduces the three strikes penalty, and helps those in prison earn uh, reduced sentences for good behavior. It also supports programs that reduce recidivism, and it finally makes leveled sentencing, sentencing charges for possession of crack and cocaine, doing away with the disparate sentencing laws that were put in place by Rockefeller in the 1990s. The important thing to note about the First Step Act is that it only affects those who are housed in federal facilities, which is just 10% of the population. Um, and, and even, also even, as the Trump uh, White House is celebrating this bill, um, they haven't promised to fund it. Um, in the uh, Trump's budget, which was re released last month in March 2019, um, includes just 14 million for the bill, and he um, had promised 75. But, and without funding, we know that, that the act will mean little to nothing. But from this national picture into the local, what will help you relate? What will help you create? What will help you become a part of something that will truly make a difference? North Country Bound is a community-engaged theater project that explores the impact of prisons in the North Country. It launched in the fall of 2018. And by that, I just mean that sometime around October at 3 a.m., I sat straight up in bed and started writing down all of the questions about justice and incarceration and this community and my role in it that wouldn't leave me alone. So applying my community cultural development methodology and my framework of questions around what will help you relate, what will help you create, what will help you become a part of something that truly makes a difference, I hatched a plan a one-woman show, and I began by seeking answers where I felt that I had the least connections and the smallest sense of understanding with the experience of correctional officers, a group of people with whom that I felt that I had little in common. So I'm using theater to address tensions around the role that prisons play in our lives by performing first-hand experiences of correctional officers retired from the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. And since October, I have been reading, learning, researching about the experience of being a correctional officer. From totes forward in guards in prisons, correctional officers at work. The officer's job is grossly mislabeled. The officer has much room for exercising his judgment, but is nominally militarily constrained. He deals with urgent and manifold inmate needs, but is officially charged with standing and watching, escorting and waiting, <coughs> opening and closing prison gates. He solves problems and dispenses justice, but is seen as administering punishment. He serves the oppressed and is seen as the oppressor. In doing work, the officer faces all sorts of obstacles and obtains few rewards. And while the officer is enjoined to be professional, it is implied that he is much too undereducated, unsophisticated, and biased to rise up to the challenge. See here, those fissures, those complications. So far, I've conducted four interviews and begun the work of pulling from this source data moments of performance, moments to which I connect. And here's how, how I do that. On one side, the transcript of the interview, everything that I, the interviewer, asks, and then everything that the uh, retired correctional officer, the respondent, responds with. And then I pull out those words, those moments that I connect with most profoundly. Um, and I arrange them poetically to create a piece of performance. Your big stereotype? Babysitter. On the other side of it, tough guy, babysitter, and nothing ever goes on in a jail. I plan to have a full 
performance in Play by Spring 2020 as I continue interview script development, staging, and rehearsals. Working to change social systems involves a lot of moments of discomfort. It involves standing up in front of people and saying things that may be unfinished. It means asking questions and exploring all of the answers, testing ideologies and assumptions, pushing beyond the do-good tropes of empathy and acceptance, and looking with naked reckoning at the scales of our future, and asking what will help you to relate, what will help you to create, what will help you to become a part of something that truly makes a difference. Thank you. Smash patriarchy.